mai tung kuljetes. Shkar ko aplikacioni në bankës Pro Credit dhe paguaj profi në përmjet telefonit mobil Android. Pro Credit Bank. Shumë profi. Hi again and uh, welcome to our next session. Uh, we'll be moving on with the next uh, panel discussion. This time we'll be diving deeper into the world of cybersecurity, uh, where we are and where we should be. I must mention uh, that this topic has been sponsored by the project ICT for Kosovo's growth. And today, uh, the, the moderator for this discussion panel will be my colleague, uh, Bashkem Islami, the a business developer at Pristina Rea and a manager at the ICT for Kosovo's growth uh, project. I'll pass on the floor to uh, Bashkem and all his uh, the discussion panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dominic, for the uh, introduction. Uh, I would like shortly to, to introduce our uh, panelists. Uh, Mr. Uh, Predrag Pajde, professor at the University of uh, Zagreb for computer references involved in uh, cyber security since uh, 1994. And he has been engaged in uh, many projects and academic works uh, about the cyber security. Welcome, uh, Mr. Pajde. Uh, we have Mr. Uh, Gerton Abazi, cybersecurity professor at the uh, University for uh, Business and Technology, with extensive experience on building information technology systems uh, and related uh, experience. Uh, welcome, Mr. Gerton. Mr. George Sharkov, professor at former cybersecurity advisor to the uh, minis Minister of uh, Defense of uh, Bulgaria. Mitko Bogdanovsky, Professor and Vice Dean at Military Academy, General Mihailo Apostoki. Uh, welcome, and uh, the floor is for uh, Mr. Mitko to open the topic of uh, discussion as uh, we agreed uh, before. I hope that you can hear me now, just to share my screen. Uh, first, I want to mention that, uh, thank you for the kind introduction, and I want to mention that the, at least up to now was some background noise, and uh, I, I can hardly uh, hear the, the moderator. I hope that uh, this will be solved during the session. Uh, I have a short presentation in, all, in order to uh, give an introduction to the topic which is uh, cybersecurity, where we are and where we should be. Uh, I don't think that I need to elaborate a lot about usage of new technologies, and uh, especially now, during these days, uh, actually this month, because we are facing with a uh, pandemic uh, that uh, is asking for usage of a lot of technologies, even now, uh, we are not there in Kosovo because actually <laughs> COVID, uh, is a problem, so uh, we decided to uh, make this session, this decision using the internet and different different technologies, etc. So, uh, however, we are aware that we are facing with the the fourth industrial uh, revolution, Industry Four, which will be more and more uh, based of uh, on uh, automation and uh, machine to machine machine communication internet of things uh, usage etc and uh, now we are talking not just about smart homes smart cities etc but we are talking about smart society uh, however we are all aware that actually we are facing with uh, huge challenges from the security perspective and uh, according many uh, security treats treat assessments actually uh, from many uh, international organizations, uh, EU, NATO, at this uh, slide you can see World Economic Forum, etc. Uh, almost all of them are saying that uh, cyber security is uh, very important and actually the treats that's happening in, the, in this cyberspace, in the cyberspace actually can be a huge challenge for all of us. Uh, so, uh, actually uh, the cyberspace can be uh, misused or used uh, for different purposes uh, for example for uh, conducting uh, cyber crime cyber enabled crime uh, intelligence uh, actually uh, not just physical intelligence but now we have a cyberspace and many uh, possibilities to uh, gather information from the cyberspace 
uh, from open source intelligence, but also from uh, using uh, many uh, tools that can go more deeply. Uh, and then information operations through the cyberspace. This is huge challenge for global huge challenge at this moment. And uh, cyber operations, conducting cyber attacks, and etc. Uh, so, what are the reasons for successful cyber attacks? Uh, there are many reasons, but uh, mostly there they could be technical, which means that uh, uh, the problem can be technologies. Uh, however, I I think that this uh, problem uh, can be solved. Not I mean always there, there can be some gaps between the technology, but if we implement uh, all the technologies that uh, are according, uh, uh, I mean, that they are secured and in, we are uh, actually implementing all the patches on time, etc. I think that uh, uh, we can mitigate the effects of the cybersecurity. However, the bigger problem, as we all know, are people, actually. You can set the technology, but it is not possible to set the human mind. It's not possible. So you can take 10 people. Uh, and educate them same art. and on the other side you can take uh, 10 computers so if you set them the same they will react always on the same uh, on, on the same uh, way however it's not the same with the people if you take them people then whatever you are te teaching them at the end they will all do the things on their own way uh, so uh, I mean uh, whatever uh, walls or whatever you put as a protection to your system there will always be people who make mistakes as for example we have here during some uh interviews uh, people are giving some interviews all those are actually employed within some uh, huge tv uh, houses and actually what you can see in the background of them there are open passwords and administrator uh, passwords that were used later for conducting some cyber attacks so always you face with this problem so that's why we need to have also to use sensors within the institutions in order to actually uh, mitigate these problems and to avoid uh, people uh, that are not aware to actually uh, make our surface uh, more uh, attractive for the attacker. Uh, whenever some breach happen, actually uh, most of the companies that deals with cybersecurity will get some call from the company that is breached and asking them to support them and to solve the problem immediately. However, the, those companies who are breached uh, should actually be aware that the, the attack didn't happen at that time. Maybe it happened three, four, six months or maybe a year ago. So uh, in this case, actually, what the company are asking for actually is to come some forensic expert to, to, to see the logs, etc. So if uh, we need actually to protect our systems, we need to act accordingly and on time. Uh, where we are, uh, if we are uh, considering uh, Western Balkans countries, uh, we made some uh, uh, analysis uh, in the in the past. Actually, we are all all doing very well, at least uh, considering regulations and laws and etc. Because we are pushed by NATO, by EU, and many other international organizations to have these uh, laws and, and and for example, certs etc. However, in reality. Uh, we all know that uh, when we come, when it comes to uh, implementation, we are facing a lot of problems. No matter if it is national cybersecurity strategy, if it is establishing of some cert or whatever. So always we have problem with implementations. So what are the four pillars uh, for protection of cyberspace? First, prevention and early warning. Then detection, of course, but not just to de detect. We need to react if something happened. And at the end, of course, sometimes the attackers will be successful, which means that uh, we uh, need to manage the crisis that will happen. Where we should be? Uh, from the technical perspective, we should have good researchers that will discover all the vulnerabilities, or at least all, uh, all, we can say uh, most of the vulnerabilities, and then to share with the uh, people who are dealing with security and to uh, produce patches for these uh, uh, vulnerabilities. And at the Additionally to this, uh, the people who need to implement patches need to follow all those uh, advances within the security and to uh, act accordingly. Also, we need to use defense in depth. Uh, and uh, I mean with this, not just different uh, 
on different levels, but also to use different technologies, because maybe we can have from, from the opposite side somebody who knows how to bridge Cisco system, but doesn't mean that he can he is educated or trained how to bridge um, HP or uh, Juniper, etc. And uh, we need to uh, work on a real uh, cyber exercises with real life simulations. Uh, from a uh, non-technical perspective, we need to have uh, national cybersecurity strategies, but we need to implement effectively, not just to have on paper, as we have all, in, in, not just in the uh, in the Western Balkans, but almost everywhere, uh, except in the in the um, uh, countries which really invest a lot. Uh, we are facing problem with implementation. We need real support from the leadership. Not always we have real support. Of course, it, uh, sometimes they have uh, another uh, uh, priorities, but really uh, we uh, realized in the last period that uh, cybersecurity should be top priority. Uh, there is a need for uh, more money to be uh, given to the companies, private sectors, and uh, institutions to deal with uh, cybersecurity uh, attacks, et cetera, and to protect actually the critical infrastructure and uh, other sectors, uh, because uh, yes, security is expensive, that, that is true. We need to educate all, not just uh, IT personnel. We need actually to uh, have effective institutions, not just to have on paper and uh, to have two or three people on national level who need to deal with uh, cybersecurity. This is, uh, this is a problem with most of the countries in the region. And we need to share information. Uh, we have problem even in the same institution to share in information, not to mention among institutions, among private and public sector, among uh, countries, uh, etc. So we need to be uh, to do much better in this uh, segment. Uh, so we need new profile of experts trained for offensive and defensive a cyber warfare. For example, I'm coming from the military. We have infantry branch and uh, in infantry branch, we are not training uh, people. Uh, we don't have separate group for offensive and separate for defensive. They are all educated for offensive and defensive uh, activities. Why? Uh, because we really need to actively participate in uh, uh, security uh, engaged to be engaged for securing the cyberspace actually we need to uh, act proactively not reactively uh, why because if we are not proactive then as i mentioned previously we are uh, we are forensic experts we are not security experts we are uh, talking about forensics so this was just short introduction to uh, the session that we have now thank you professor Mitra, thank you Okay, thank you for, for the question. Uh, I can go also with slides and uh, I have, because I have uh, some good slides, which think, I think that are, are, can be useful when, especially when I'm presenting, uh, there, there will be like a backup for my presentation. Uh, so if it's not problem. So going back in the history, we all know that actually first uh, there was just a land uh, uh, war where people actually, the, the soldiers were mainly used uh, shields and uh, swords and arrows. And then actually with the new technology development, uh, warships were built and the conflict was expanded to the sea. So we actually have now sea war. Uh, later, actually, with the new innovations, the uh, fighter jets were produced and uh, the uh, war was expanded in the air. And uh, later, we have another innovation. We have satellites, space shuttles, etc. So we can talk about air war. Uh, and uh, we actually are aware now that the technology is actually spreading through all those uh, domains that are already mentioned mentioned and they are using in the military uh, in, in, in the security sector uh, much more these uh, technologies and even the last soldiers have, have uh, a lot of uh, technology with them in order for example their commander to follow what's happening in, on the battlefield um, battlefield uh, sorry uh, so now uh, we are facing actually with the new domain which uh, is uh, 
officially recognized by NATO and it is called uh, uh, cyber uh, domain. And uh, sorry, uh, actually, uh, as I mentioned, this domain is spreading across all the other domains. Uh, and uh, additionally to uh, the cyber domain, we have actually weaponized social media and cultural, uh, cultural engagement. So I already mentioned about cyber and how it is misused. And uh, the problem actually that uh, we have with the cyber domain and why we are so actually, why we are and many actual organizations think that uh, cyber is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing uh, is that actually the cyber weapons that are used are very effective. And we have a lot of examples showing the effective, effectiveness of this weapon. It is affordable and uh, it is deniable. So anyone can say that I was not behind this attack, especially if uh, they hide their actually uh, action that they did. Uh, and uh, yes, there is a problem also about cyber weapon because it has a uh, time of expiration. Uh, I mean, uh, if uh, somebody find that such a uh, cyber uh, weapon exists, then there will be uh, intervention from cybersecurity guys. And uh, at the end, uh, of course, patches will be produced, etc. cetera. So uh, immediately when it will be found, uh, the cyber weapon, it means that it expired. If, of course, we are, uh, uh, the, we actually are uh, implementing all the necessary patches. So what will be the next domain? Some are saying robotics, but it is not next domain. We are using even now uh, the, this domain. Uh, the, some are saying why we, we are not using uh, actually smart, more smart technologies. Uh, actually, why robots are not uh, making decisions by their own. The problem is not that we cannot produce such robots. The problem is that uh, uh, people, uh, that from the ethical aspect, it is problem because we don't want a uh, robot to make decision to kill somebody on the battlefield. And the other new domain that uh, was actually at least few uh, years ago was uh, announced uh, was the drone. But really, it's not new domain. It is some domain that is uh, used at this moment. What about micro drones? Drones? Maybe it is something that will happen in the future, or maybe it is something that is happening right now, because this was actually uh, presented. Uh, year year and a half ago on a conference when such micro robot is used for killing people uh, so another uh, new domain maybe uh, would be nanotechnologies where actually for example bomber over battlefield can drop millions of such uh, devices which can take care about our soldiers or we can which can make some problems to uh, enemy soldiers or maybe dna uh, some experts are publishing papers saying that uh, some other experts are working on genetic weapons which means they they want to produce to make uh, 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 ethnic ethnic uh, actually to make a, a soldier of the future which will be uh, will be much uh, ideal, actually, soldier, or uh, other are working on ethnic weapons based on DNA, uh, or artificial intelligence, which will be discussed more, I suppose, today and tomorrow. But this is, of course, uh, one of the uh, future domains. So this is uh, what I wanted to cover, uh, and uh, which is uh, actually connected with uh, the question that I had. Uh, can you please um, also touch uh, upon the state uh, supported efforts towards cyber security vs organized crime is taking uh, advantage of it? As we during the preparation we discuss about this question and I, I thought that it, it will be interesting for the uh, other participants here to share uh, at least we, during the other conferences, NATO supported, etc. what we think that maybe could be a future challenge uh, and uh, how to make distinction between state supported or governmental cyber attacks and uh, cyber criminal attacks and what are 
the real differences. Actually, when we are, the, the main difference is that uh, when actually uh, cyber criminals uh, have some aim actually to target, to target some, uh, let's say, financial, uh, to target financial sector, some bank, they will try with one bank. And if they are not successful, if, for example, the bank has good security measures implemented, then for sure they will not stay uh, with that bank. They will go to another bank. They will go to third bank, etc. Up to the, they succeed to actually uh, bridge some of the banks and to uh, get some financial benefit benefits. However, this is not the same when we are talking about state-supported actors. And when they get some uh, uh, message from their uh, from some directives from the government, they will uh, actually try to do whatever they can in order to actually bridge some institution, some government, etc. So uh, they will be persistent in their aim. They will not focus on another country, on the third country, etc. They will actually try to do everything to actually get uh, to the point. Uh, there are many uh, examples when the criminals used uh, the cyberspace in order to get um, financial benefits. For example, Carbonac is well known, it's not new. Uh, and actually, uh, yes, it was conducted online using the cyberspace, but additionally, they used uh, mules in order to get money. money. Uh, so this is... Uh, Actually, what reality was captured from in reality was captured in Spain. How they uh, actually uh, got the money, and of course, they some of the money was trans, uh, transferred to the online, but some were uh, gathered on this way. Uh, what they are doing now are uh, they are fo focusing more and more on cri cryptocurrencies. Why? Because law enforcement uh, is not uh, so focused on protection on cryptocurrencies, at least now at this moment. Maybe in the future they will be focused more, so uh, they will not experience the same uh, problem as they will be experiencing if they uh, actually attack some banks. So that's why they are focused more and more on cryptocurrencies. Uh, cyber espionage can be conducted from uh, organized crime, but uh, it is much more uh, conducted by uh, state-supported actor, and there are many examples of this. For example, a few days ago, far, I actually said that uh, they were uh, attacked and they were breached, actually, and uh, some information were stolen from some state uh, actor. Uh, and uh, all those tools that are used for cyber espionage, they are uh, written, actually, uh, on different languages. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, the, the uh, the main language is the same, but uh, in behind the, the, what they are uh, putting as uh, information, uh, they are on different languages. But it doesn't mean, for example, if it is written on a Russian language, that uh, uh, Russia is behind them. For example, Red October, if we consider Red October, one third of the attacks that were discovered uh, and the uh, bridges actually was uh, in uh, Southeast Europe. Uh, so, uh, and uh, actually one of the main targets uh, was uh, Russia. So we cannot uh, really say that uh, just because it is written on uh, Russian language, Russia is behind it. Uh, okay, uh, cyber war. Uh, some of the uh, experts in NATO are using this, uh, this word, but however, in the last period, they actually don't want to use uh, so much because it is actually as a tool, the cyber is used as a tool uh, to support the other uh, segments of the warfare. And uh, actually now we are more and more using uh, the term hybrid war. And uh, the example when actually the Russians are using the cyber as a weapon was uh, when they succeed to breach uh, phones of the uh, Ukrainian soldiers on the battlefield, and they uh, enabled a GPS location, and they found their location and shared with artillery and uh, air forces. So uh, many countries are working on development of cyber weapons, cyber warriors, etc. So who has the best offensive capabilities? Nobody can say, because it is a little bit foggy. foggy. 
in example, uh, everyone can say who is the biggest, uh, who has the best capacities for and capabilities for uh, air, who has the best air forces, uh, land forces, etc. But for the cyber forces, it is a little bit problematic to to say who is the best. Uh, I will uh, mention just uh, two cases here: Russia and China. Uh, they have great minds. They, they have uh, some similarities. They have great minds. They are working on uh, development in different areas. And uh, what is similar for them, uh, they want to show actually when they uh, conduct different uh, attacks in the cyberspace. Uh, I'm not saying that the other are not doing the same, but for example, if USA attacks, they will not uh, want others to uh, to be sure that us or israel or iran is behind the attack however for russia and china this is not the case and uh, but what is different for for this uh, country uh, i'm pretty much sure that uh, all of the participants in this uh, in this uh, session have at least one uh, digital uh, device which is produced in in, uh, in in China or maybe all the devices that we are using but I'm sure that no one here have any device that is produced in Russia and I already mentioned that they all have uh, great minds and they uh, Russia also can produce some of the devices what is behind why they don't want to uh, share their technologies I'm not sure so I cannot uh, explain this, but I just wanted to open maybe for discussions. And the other problem, which I didn't mention, is terrorist use of cyberspace. They are using for different purposes, but the last period we saw a lot of examples when actually they even, uh, they didn't use just for radicalization, communication, etc., but they even used for uh, targeted attacks. So uh, this was what I wanted to mention about uh, this uh, question. So, uh, of course, I am open for uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we will... Yes, hello. Thank you, Bashkim. Dear participants, thank you very much. Also, uh, as Mitt mentioned, that this is very a big issue currently in the, in the field since we are combining some technical uh, technological aspects with the human behaviors. So basically, we are living in the era where the cybersecurity is a huge concern. And at the same time, we are dealing with the most famous question that uh, should we follow only the technological progress or ICT standards, policies that will help us to get protected or we should work also with ourselves also on changing the behaviors that will impact directly and indirectly in our protection uh, or also our organizations. It is important that in order to prevent these data breaches or any security breaches in the field, the behaviors that cause them need to be identified and changed as well, since because there are a lot of issues that happens, not because of a technical failure, but because of our behaviors. Since as we already know that on the cybersecurity issues, the weakest link is the human factor that always fails on this, on this aspect. But at the same time, we see this also one uh, common, common misconceptions to the cybersecurity about the technology. Of course, that we all agree that technology is obviously a massive part of the cybersecurity, but it's not enough to be protected, especially from the modern cyber threats that currently are happening, and as well some of them that Professor Bogdanovsky also mentioned. Basically, what hackers and cyber criminals are doing currently is that they are regularly exploiting the human elements of the victims and by focusing on changing their behaviors cyber resilience is a shift so basically they are working to change the behaviors of the persons not impacting the technology that they are currently using but in the same times in other in other side there is a huge issue concern and a lot of challenges on how that we can change the people's behaviors on relation to the technology since we know that most of the time the human natures are creatures of habits and influencing, which means that letting them changing their behaviors is very hard and the complex process, especially the relation to the technology and the social media, because we know that most of the time people younger are influencers to the social media and basically the social media is 
is uh, affecting or have the impact on the changing of the behavior of the, of the, of the persons. Uh, what we must consider, that is, I think it is worth tackling because in doing so, we can help people to protect themselves online, offline, as well at home and the world. And basically, on this part, this is my last the summary, is that the psychology of the cybersecurity issues on how to think about the behaviors could lie on, four, on three main pillars that we are using. First is the awareness or capabilities, which means that, or as we call it on the cybersecurity, or we often refer to this as an awareness, such as having the knowledge is about the risk, but we have a lack of capability on doing on it. The last part is the decision-making and motivation, which is sometimes are the opportunities where the cybersecurity needs to be usable for people that will be engaged or work with us. But we have sometimes issues with the physical opportunities or physical security of the, of the technology, which is still the most overlooked component in cybersecurity and is the key reason why awareness campaigns always fail. Because we are aware that many organizations and many companies are doing most of the time, all the time, campaigns about the awareness on the field of the cybersecurity, but usually they fail due to these issues. And the last one is the environmental issues or motivation. This is something that we have to work on it. Uh, according to many literature, to many researchers that did until now, Gartner and so on, uh, we have to find a solution how we can energize and affect directly behaviors by motivating because most of the time, younger and very old people are, 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 are impact on, on this. So basically, this is very important issue that how we should connect that using the technology, equipments, hardware and devices and connecting with the behaviors of people. So basically, uh, those two function together. We cannot work and use a high level equipment, but at the same time, so we do not change the behaviors of people in regard to the, to the security. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bjarpa. Uh, what about the threats that um, intelligent systems face in uh, keeping data oh. networks uh, safe? Yes, those are very, very much linked. Also, this is very good linked also with the uh, Mitko's presentation. So we are just following and detailing the, the issues. Uh, Cybercrime is now uh, the most present issue, which is facing with the governments, public and private sector around the world. In fact, the cyber crimes has affected also use during also during this pandemia, COVID-19 pandemia. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we are living in the age of data, where we have this explosive data growth that we are experiencing shows that there is no sign of stopping because many reports shows that in total worldwide, the data will grow up to 163 zettabytes in the next 10 years which is a huge, which is a massive. And all this data came, especially from uh, uh, Internet of Things, tools, big data analytics, and many, many others. And what is important is that nowadays, many organizations started to recognize the need for the cyber intelligence as a critical weapon against advanced cyber attacks. We have reached the age where advanced target attacks are happening using very sophisticated uh, uh, tools, techniques, algorithms, and the others. But the issue and the concern is that the market for this cyber threat intelligence systems is relatively young, which means that it's not always clear which options are available for the same protections. Because threat intelligence play, uh, tools and threat intelligence systems plays a crucial role on the cybersecurity defense. But this must be understood very correctly by the uh, professionals that are using this on various domains of the cybersecurity, especially the professionals or cybersecurity experts which works on the security operation centers dealing with security information event management systems or any, on a, uh, or any other tools such as incident response teams and, and the others. Uh, what we call on the cybersecurity field is that the, the change is the only constant. What does this mean? This means that even if an ever evolving age of cybersecurity, one thing has always remained constant, is the rise of the cyber attacks. 
this have never changed until now from the beginning when this happened. And one of the biggest, as we can say, takeaways of the cyber threat intelligence systems is the change of the security approach from the reactive to proactive, which means that it will bring the proactive defense against any threat that could happen and will emerge outside. But it can only, only be done if it's relevant to the, to the issue. So basically, according to this, and using this threat intelligence system that we are developing, or we are working with this, is there are three main issues that could be happen, that could be used to transfer the data that the cyber intelligence system will use. It's the part of the contextualized data, evidence-based data, and the relevant data. So basically, any threat or any vulnerability that may happen to organizations, those threat intelligence systems should make this contextualization of the issue, evidence-based according to the situation and the relevance. If something happened also before and how we can, we can, we can change this. Regarding the use or the impact of the implementation of the threat intelligence system to the business functions, this application within our, on organizations can be summarized in four main categories. Those categories that we can use are the way how we use threat intelligence system as a predictive tools, as a preventive tools, detective tools, and the response. So basically, we should not wait, or organizations should not wait to react on any cyber attacks just after that happened, but those should take measures to work towards something that will not happen before. Or at least if it will happen, the damages will be very, very, very low. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bjarke. I'm open for any question or discussion for, for this. Uh, we, we will continue with the Professor George. Uh, let's get uh, a bit in the, into cyberspace and the fifth domain. Uh, what do you feel, what do you think is uh, the recognition and focus at the national level? So strategies and capacities towards this uh, particular uh, domain. And um, I will uh, kindly ask you if we could have a short answer since uh, uh, we have uh, only 50 minutes more uh, and we want to involve uh, each other in, in the deb uh, debate. Thank you for your understanding, uh, Professor George. Yep. Uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, um, I will be short because Mitko covered most of the topics, uh, the background topics actually in his review. Uh, if we speak about the national uh, strategy and implementation level, and capacity building. Uh, uh, let me start with this, uh, uh, that uh, currently in pandem pandemic uh, conditions where we are forced to, to do virtualized life and business, uh, it became clear that we are, have not performed properly the digital transformation of our society. And uh, this, uh, this became evident not because the functions or the broadband or the internet and that part was not there, and it's becoming uh, quite obvious because cybersecurity was not uh, uh, in focus when we were doing the digital transformation. In very few strategies, cybersecurity is uh, linked to, to the successful as a, a factor of success of digital transformation. It's mainly about cybersecurity, like standalone, protecting the domain, and so on. Uh, so this is the first point. Second point is that uh, uh, the we focus mainly on the cyber security and uh, uh, the preventive and uh, protection activities. Uh, the real cyber security or the real protection or the use of uh, the uh, cyber space as the field domain where we live and where we uh, operate anymore uh, these days uh, more and more uh, is uh, uh, the focus on resilience. In cyber resilience, it's much more than protecting. So it's cyber resilience is to protect uh, or to prepare for the unknown unknown. So if we say that uh, uh, information security in general is based on the CIA triad, uh, the classical one. So these are the known knowns, the things we know and the things we uh, can detect and protect. Uh, but uh, the higher level like cyber security is protecting against APT, state actors, not non-state actors, campaigns and so on. We still have factors that we can detect. So, uh, so like our uh, prevention detection, IPS, the IDS systems and so on, they can signal something. 
but how to prepare for the unknown unknowns. So those are the new un undefined, unexpected uh, uh, vulnerabilities and threats uh, uh, quite frequently already operated by artificial intelligence adapted to, uh, targeted to our uh, specific uh, ecosystem. Uh, there, the only solution is not to detect and counterfeit them, uh, uh, but to prepare really to make our operations, our systems, uh, uh, our business resilient. Which simply means a totally different mindset uh, in addition to uh, security by design and implementation, which is uh, uh, the key factor for cybersecurity, uh, proactive measures, uh, uh, the, then became like resilience by design. And uh, so this is one point, and uh, this is actually changing and uh, reshaping majority of the uh, strategies of the countries. So uh, you saw the examples of the region, in addition to what Mitch uh, showed, and especially the uh, we are expecting the new strategy of Kosovo, actually. Uh, that is based, uh, and this is a, a very good example, how the strategy could be based on a, a objective assessments of the situation and the result. Because uh, as far as I'm uh, aware, there are like two rounds of this uh, uh, cyber maturity model uh, at national level uh, that was used uh, and uh, the assessments that are done pre year 2015 and actually last year. And that will help uh, 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 redefining the plan and the measures. Now, talking about the plans and the measures, uh, uh, the plans are usually quite detailed and very ambitious. However, the implementation, as Mitko men mentioned, is uh, 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 it's not successful. Uh, first, it is delayed. Second, is, it is usually quite fragmented. And the most important is that usually the plans around the strategies, they do not have focused budget on that. It's relying on uh, uh, different donor programs, AU programs, like in our case in Bulgaria, uh, uh, and many also in Kosovo as well, pre-accession funds and so on. Uh, so building this capacity uh, or implementing the measures and the projects under the implementation plan, uh, uh, brings like a fragmented approach. Uh, this is not consolidated capacity. And uh, also uh, it depends on the uh, activity of the of the uh, coordinators of these projects rather than the national approach. And here we come to the underestimated role of the national coordination, national cybersecurity coordinator. I was playing this cyber tsar, tsar role for three years in Bulgaria, exactly when we were uh, adopting the strategy. And among the main achievements was really the multi-stakeholder approach and uh, sitting on the same page, aligning the projects and capability development. However, this resulted only in, a, and this is the legal part, uh, uh, only in a cyber act or the cyber law that we have since uh, 2018, which defines majority of the implementation aspects of the NIS directive, cyber hygiene is in something, uh, all these aspects. But uh, uh, this is uh, definitely not enough. And now we are revising the strategy and actually the plan, making this uh, more clear definitions of the maturity levels we need to achieve. So from cybersecurity to cyber resilience, the roles of different uh, stakeholders, and uh, also the role of uh, 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 this uh, capacity consolidation and uh, moving from capacity to uh, capabilities. Because the real capacity, uh, no doubt, is in industry and academia. So it's outside of the public stru uh, structures. However, the certs, the national certs and these Gov certs, they are mainly done by the governments and they are typically under staffs, couple, couple of people. Yeah. There are no sectoral certs, uh, uh, or at least not that I know. Uh, these information sharing centers and so on. So the sectoral approach, uh, uh, the coordinated approach, uh, uh, at hope we do these exercises. We assemble the rapid reaction teams instead of uh, talking about cyber forces like uh, mature countries. And uh, last but not least, uh, lo looking on proactive, not as uh, uh, just offensive capabilities, that is good for military, and I'm advisor in that, and our cyber command is uh, going to do that, not only to play the red teaming, but also to be able to counter fight. But proactive means also these measures that we do, we prepare for the resilience. And when we speak about the fifth domains of sovereignty, we should uh, consider that the civil resilience covers all the other uh, domains and actually it really uh, focused the preparation of citizens economy for such uh, situations of emergency like we are now. So uh, where we should be, uh, uh, because that's the topic of our session in the end, we know where we are, we know the threats, uh, we know the actors, actually we know bad actors more uh, better than uh, our actors, what we our capabilities. And, uh, and uh, where we should be, uh, it's really for me cyber resilience, prepare also for the new technologies, 
uh, using these new technologies like uh, cyber, uh, but not forget that new technologies, they bring new vulnerabilities. So my favorite uh, appeal there is like uh, uh, not only using AI for cyber protection, intelligent, because malicious, uh, malicious use of AI is already a fact uh, by the bad guys, but uh, also consider like cyber for AI and majority of activities of ENISA, European Union, and this uh, the, the cyber uh, the AI uh, strategy is really how to secure AI from the technical, but also from the implementation in use viewpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Professor George, for uh, your contribution and uh, discussion. We will continue with uh, Professor Pade. Uh, lately, uh, we have been hearing quite a bit uh, uh, quantum uh, computing. In this line of uh, thought, if uh, quantum computing will be able to break all uh, current cryptographs, uh, what does uh, that mean for our uh, archives? Are they safe? Professor Fajda? Yeah, so there are many technologies that are currently very interesting in, for the professionals and the public, like 5G networks, etc. But uh, quantum computing and artificial intelligence are persistently here, and we have uh, high hopes from them. Quantum computing, among other things, we believe will be so powerful and so fast that it can break today's uh, cryptographic algorithms because current cryptographic algorithms are based on the fact that the computers, uh, current cryptographic algorithms are based on the fact that the current computers uh, are not fast enough to break them in a million years, but quantum computing will be able. Now, if they can break algorithm in a matter of hours or minutes, uh, then uh, we will have a problem with all our secret things. Now, of course, we also hope that there will be new quantum cryptography algorithms that can protect us. But what will happen with our archives? Because all the things that we have put on tapes or disk or somewhere, and they are protected with, with cryptography, now all of a sudden cannot be protected. And we cannot believe in anything we have. We cannot believe in any data in our archives, which are only digital, if there is no some printed document that we improve that has been uh, original. And uh, how to do it? What to do about it? How to, um, how to create mechanisms to solve this huge amount of archive data, which needs to be trusted? Another problem, another technology that we have is artificial intelligence. Now, it is again in the focus of uh, professionals or in general public. And we have high expectations from, you know, driving cars by computers to having someone helping me do routine work. I don't want to pay bills. I don't want to bother with the investment of my money, receiving and sending a lot of information, answering all kinds of requests for information. I want somebody to do this and I want a computer program to do this. And, uh, an intelligent computer program agent. Now, it seems that it will be possible. We would like to have not only specialized artificial intelligence tools, but we would like to have uh, general intelligence. I mean, uh, programs and computers that are behaving like humans in a broad spectrum of views and to be uh, intelligent at least like a teenager, a kid of 12 or 13 years old. Now, the problem with this is that you cannot just have cognitive uh, intelligence. You have also to have ethics and morality because otherwise they won't be able to do things properly. We won't be satisfied with what they do with our information, our tools, our homes, our money, uh, whatever. So um, the problem that is going to become is the following. If we have an agent, we bought a program that uh, is doing investment or sending information or whatever, and um, we configure it to do something for us. And then this program does something which is not legal or is immoral or is uh, in any way harming somebody. Who is going to be responsible? Is it me, the user? But I actually don't understand how the things work. We no longer understand how our cars work or how our elevator works or whatever. Our computer, how it works, we don't understand. We use them. So we won't be able to understand how artificial intelligence works to prevent uh, any undesirable effect. Uh, is it going to be a programmer that you will be blaming? But the programmer 
cannot foresee all possible ways we can be using uh, their artificial intelligence programs. So who are we going to be holding responsible? Who is going to be responsible for bad things that our intelligent agents will do on our behalf? The situation is even more complicated because I as a user, you as a programmer, he or she as my partner that we communicate with, and the pro computers that actually this artificial intelligence will be running somewhere in the cloud, they all are in different countries and different legislations. So which legislation applies to what has happened? And finally, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology has shown with their project Moral Machine that we people around the world have completely different sense of morality. When they asked who to kill, um, many old people or, or several young people and vice versa, um, by your car, which is driven by computer, how to program your car, people around the world couldn't agree because we have different views, different values. So the problem is that the technology of artificial intelligence has to be coupled with some kind of ethics programmed in, but we don't know which ethics we actually wanted to have. And then again, if, even if in this case happens a problem, who is going to be responsible? So these are two things, quantum computing in our archives and trusting our past, our digital past, and artificial intelligence acting on our behalf, the responsibility. These two things I see as um, things that we need to look at in the future. So as a conclusion, what is our status? Currently, we don't have enough imagination to visualize the future. We are very short-sighted. We're not paranoid enough what bad things could happen. And the problem is that we cannot solve these problems only one country cannot solve them and it cannot be solved for just one country. Our country has solved it and the others uh, should do it by themselves. We can't, we have to do this joint, jointly. So we need creativity, very long-term planning and global collaboration to solve these things. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Pade, for your uh, presentation and uh, discussion. Due to time restrictions, uh, we will have to, to conclude our uh, discussion here. If uh, somebody shortly wants to add something about uh, our uh, discussion. Uh, otherwise, I have to thank uh, all of you for your uh, contribution and your time and uh, your uh, the valuable pre presentations, um, insights of the cybersecurity world. Thank you very much. Thank you.